The America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to americasdemocrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. And we say hello to Michael Mann, Distinguished Professor of Meteorology at Penn State University, also the Director of the Penn State Earth System Science Center, or ESSC, and the author most recently of The New Climate War, The Fight to Take Back Our Planet. Michael Mann, thank you so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Oh, thank you, Jim. It's great to be with you. And uh, great for us to have you with us Um You've been at the forefront of the climate war for decades. Your new book is about how it's a different kind of war than when you began your work. Is it safe to say that this is a war defined more about how we fight climate change as opposed to denying the fact that it even exists? Yeah, that's uh, precisely the case. Uh, For decades, you know, we witnessed uh, basic uh, attacks, assaults uh, by fossil fuel interests and those promoting their agenda on the basic scientific uh, evidence. And scientists like myself were at the receiving end, uh, not only of efforts to discredit our work, but uh, efforts to intimidate us uh, and even threats of violence. Uh, So the good news is that we've largely moved beyond that um, to a large extent because you just can't deny climate change uh, is happening anymore. The, you know, the forces of inaction, the inactivists, as I call them in the book, fossil fuel interests and, and those doing their bidding, recognize that it isn't credible anymore um, to claim that climate change is happening, to, to really t- try to go after the, the basic scientific evidence. So instead, you know, they've turned to a new set of tactics. The old climate war was the effort to discredit the the basic science and the scientists. The new climate war is this new set of tactics that they've turned to, because look, they haven't given up. Um, Fossil fuel interests aren't just going to roll over. Uh, They want to continue to make billions of dollar profits year after year, and they're going to do everything they can to extend that as far into the future as they can. And that means now turning to an insidious array of other tactics to try to thwart the the decarbonization uh, of our economy, to try to uh, stop or block uh, the effort to leave our addiction of fossil fuels uh, and uh, move towards renewable energy. And those tactics include uh, efforts to divide climate advocates, uh, deflection away from Uh, the need for systemic solutions towards individual behavioral uh, action. Michael, I want to touch on something that you just touched on. You warn against an emphasis on individual action. So where exactly is that message coming from and how does it impede the fight against climate change? Yeah, so, you know, it's important to recognize that, of course, we should engage in in those, you know, actions, those uh, behaviors that help reduce our environmental footprint, that help reduce our carbon footprint. Um, And in many cases, you know, these are things that save us money, they make us uh, happier and healthier, um, and they set a good example for other people. So we should, of course, do all those things. What we can't allow to happen is for those who uh, are not in favor of meaningful policy change to somehow deflect attention entirely Uh, towards individual behavior um, to the exclusion of the needed policies that we need. Because after all, neither you nor I can uh, put a price on carbon or provide subsidies for fossil fuel, uh, to provide subsidies for renewable energy or take away subsidies for fossil fuels or block um, funding for new uh, fossil fuel infrastructure. These are things we need our government to do. And the uh, forces of inaction, the inactivists, have 
actually sort of fanned the flames of this, um, you know, tendency to focus on individual behavior. It's an old tactic. The uh, beverage industry used this back in uh, the 1970s, the famous crying Indian advertisement uh, with the tearful uh, Native American uh, that, uh, you know, uh, impacted a whole generation. Uh, and it was about, you know, cleaning up the environment. And we all thought it was this very empowering, you know, uh, and inspiring sort of ad campaign, those of us who were growing up at the time, uh, only to learn now, you know, that it was actually a ruse. It was a propaganda campaign hatched on Madison Avenue by Coca-Cola in the beverage industry. They didn't want to see bottle bills pass in the various states, um, which would require, you know, the returning and, and processing of bottles and cans. It would clean up the litter, but it would hurt their bottom line, their profits. So instead, they funded this major advertising campaign to make it all about individual behavior. We, you and I just have to be better environmental stewards and pick up those cans and bottles. We don't need a systemic solution to this problem. And thanks to their efforts, um, we now have, along with global climate change, one of the other great global environmental crises of the day, uh, global plastic pollution. And we uh, have the beverage industry to th and their deflection campaign to thank for that. So the fossil fuel industry, you know, picked up that, um, you know, they, they, they've run with that uh, playbook and mm -hmm. they've used the same tactics. The notion of an individual carbon footprint was actually popularized by BP in the early 2000s. And they came out with one of the first individual carbon footprint calculators because they want us focusing on our carbon footprint our carbon footprint rather than theirs. And so that's really what we're talking about, the effort by fossil fuel interests to make the conversation entirely about individual behavioral change so that we're not talking about the needed systemic changes in policies. And it's been very effective. I mean, even our, our leading media outlets, the New York Times, to a large extent, has actually bought into that framing. I pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, I guess. Is, uh... <laughs> exactly kind of a scenario for this. Um, you also warn against doom and gloom scenarios that suggest we're past a tipping point to do anything about climate change. Again, where is that message coming from and what is its impact on the climate change movement? Yeah, so it's another one of those cases where, you know, the people who, uh, who are genuinely concerned about the problem uh, have become victims in, once again, a very effective tactic here um, an effort to convince them that, in fact, it's so bad that it's too late to do anything uh, about that. And so understandably, there are people who are very concerned um, and there does need to be a sense of urgency because this is a crisis. Uh, the climate, there's a reason we call it the climate crisis. It's a crisis. Uh, but we also know and the science tells us that there is still time to make the changes necessary to avert the worst impacts of climate change. So we have urgency, but as I like to say, there is also agency. We can still make a direct difference. And what some, uh, and we see this uh, largely in online fora, social media, where bad state actors, uh, petro state actors like Russia um, have tried to uh, use bots and, and, and trolls uh, online to sort of steer the climate discourse. Um, in a direction that's preferential to their agenda. Russia, you know, their, their greatest assets right now are their fossil fuels still in the ground. Um, and Putin believes that they will prosper uh, from the continued extraction and sale of, of their fossil fuels. Uh, they even, uh, Putin has even gone on record saying he thinks climate change would be good for Russia. Well, that's not true at all. And the Siberian wildfires of 2010 should have told them otherwise. But because of that, um, they and other uh, potentially other state actors have sort of manipulated online discussions to, you know, try to defeat efforts, uh, policy efforts, uh, interfere in other countries like France, uh, Australia and Canada and the United States when it comes to carbon pricing uh, legislation to try to make that unpopular, to try to turn public tide against it. And they have for example, fan the flames of doomism. Uh, we see trolls and bots that have promoted um, this sort of messaging. And there are, you know, uh, 
there are organizations um, that actually track this stuff and they can tell if a particular online conversation is being driven by bots um, that are lar- or, or, and, and bots that are likely uh, state um, controlled. And there is evidence that that indeed is, is going on. And, and, uh, and much of their messaging among other things, is that uh, it's too late to do anything. And so the victims are, you know, in large part, uh, environmental progressives who actually care about the problem, but ironically are being convinced that's too late to do anything about it. And that's really what is so pernicious about this particular effort, because look, the forces of inaction largely have had the right side of our political spectrum on board for their agenda of climate inaction. Here, they're actually co-opting folks on the left, uh, weaponizing them for their agenda. Wow. That's just amazing to me. Um, Moving to what has to happen now, what are the actual policies that governments need to be taking to counter the power and influence of fossil fuel companies and fossil fuel countries, for instance, Russia? Well, you know, uh, the bad news is, of course, uh, under the previous president, uh, Donald Trump was directly facilitating that sort of behavior, uh, complicit in those efforts, Um, not only in domestic efforts by fossil fuel interests to dismantle uh, meaningful environmental policies and, and climate policies, but actually enabling bad actors like Russia. Um, to uh, to stir the pot in the way that they've been doing. That's the bad news. The good news is, of course, we've seen a dramatic shift in direction now with the new administration. And Joe Biden has signaled two very important things right out of the starting gate. One, the United States is now once again going to lead the global effort to act on climate. We are going to display the sort of moral and actual leadership um, that we once did on this issue. And I think that that will have huge implications for other countries that have been waffling. Countries like Australia are going to feel newfound pressure now that the United States is once really back in the game. Uh, at the same time, the Biden administration has indicated that they are no go- longer going to tolerate this sort of behavior by Russia. And so you can expect to see quite a bit of pushback against efforts by Russia and other foreign actors to try to manipulate uh, public opinion uh, through, you know, the the the, the various um, cyber sort of uh, espionage and 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 cy- cyber um, you know uh, uh, operations that they've been engaged in. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and the president has described it as uh, climate change. It is as a maximum threat that that must be met with urgency. Um, we've seen some actions taken so far. But with that emphasis of the Biden administration to fight climate change, do you have any concerns that he may not go far enough? You know, I think a lot of us did. And those concerns are really sort of melting away because he he really has taken surprisingly (laughs) uh, bold steps very early on. Um, It's remarkable to me that he's actually made climate sort of one of his four central issues that he says he wants to focus on in the first hundred days. And among his first acts, his first executive actions, a whole day was devoted to, to climate and uh, signing uh, a, uh, you know, a, a, a whole um, you know, array of uh, executive actions that I characterized at the time and I would continue to characterize as coming as close as you could possibly come through executive actions alone in implementing a Green New Deal. I mean, the policies, the executive actions that he's taking look a lot like the policy goals of the sort of Green New Deal legislation that's been proposed by folks like AOC um, and Ed Markey. And the reality is that to really see, you know, uh, to really move forward, um, Uh, on climate, we're going to need legislation as well. We're going to need climate legislation. No question about that. A a set of bills that that legislate um, these the the same sort of principles that Biden is trying to, um, you know, embrace in, in these executive actions. But I mean, he's gone about as far with executive actions as a chief executive could really go. Um, And I think he's going to be working very closely with Democrats who've shown some real spine here as well 
who, um, you know, in the old days were willing to give in to the sorts of tactics used by Republicans, filibusters to prevent uh, any meaningful climate action. You needed 60 votes. Uh, the Democrats have said enough of that. We're going to pass this stuff through reconciliation with 50 votes and a tie-breaking vote by the vice president, if that's what we need to do. And so I am very hopeful, not only that we're, we are seeing action already on the executive front, but that we will see that complemented with real climate legislation. We're speaking with Michael Mann, Distinguished Professor of Meteorology at Penn State University, also director of the Penn State ESSC, and author most recently of The New Climate War, The Fight to Take Back Our Planet. Michael, you argue that this is a fight for that all of us need to be a part of, and you describe the work of the youth climate movement as a game changer. What can we all learn from this movement? Yeah. So, you know, they've been inspiring and I'm, you know, proud to, you know, call uh, Greta Thunberg, who's sort of uh, effectively the the leader of that global movement, um, a a friend. And I uh, have done everything that I can do as an adult to try to support the actions these kids are taking, while at the same time trying to signal to my fellow adults that we can't put this on the kids. Um, this is about our ethical obligation to them. Uh, they're not in a position at this point, most of them, to vote and to directly impact uh, policy. Uh, but they are impacting the conversation. They are impacting the discussion. They've given us sort of a foot in the door. And now the rest of us uh, have to walk through that door. Uh, and we have to make sure that their efforts are not in vain and that we do everything that we can to make sure that Our legacy is not a degraded planet for future generations. Um, We, to an extent, have started the the important turn in that direction uh, with this last election, where we did vote in a president who campaigned on climate, um, has a mandate uh, to act on climate, and is already implementing it. Uh, And uh, amazingly, with those two wins in North Carolina, by the narrowest of margins, but a Democratic Senate, that will bring climate legislation to the floor and I think pass it. And so it's up to the rest of us now to be inspired by these kids, to recognize that this is about something much greater than science and policy and economics and politics. It's about ethics, about um, intergenerational ethics, about the ethics, uh, you know, uh, the ethical quandary that those who created this problem, industrial nations, have created a problem where those who had the least role, uh, the you know developing world, um, are going to see the worst impacts uh, and have the least resilience and the least adaptive capacity. And so, more than anything else, this is an, an ethical uh, you know, climate change is an uh, is a crisis in in ethics, and we have to make sure that um, you know that our legacy not be that. We saw the problem and failed to to act in time. And before we let you go, you have expressed cautious optimism um, that we are heading in the right direction on climate change, even as its impact becomes clearer. What gives you reason for continued optimism? Yeah, well, you know, it's a number of things. We've talked about probably two principal <laughs> reasons for that optimism, uh, the just the inspirational nature of the youth climate movement that has really finally recentered this conversation where it needed to be all along about our, our ethical obligation to act. Um, I think that that's created real opportunity. Um, it has intersected with important uh, social movements. Um, the, you know, the, 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 uh, we have gone through some very important uh, tipping points of the good kind. There are tipping points of the bad kind, climate tipping points that we uh, hope to avoid and that we must try to avoid. But then there's social tipping points like marriage equality. Um, and now, and it, you know, a few years ago, uh, we saw this dramatic shift in public opinion. And now we've, uh, we have a much more progressive sort of set of, of policies when it comes to marriage equality here in the United States. Uh, I believe we are going through such a moment on issues of racial justice. And of course, those issues intersect in a profound way with environmental justice um, and with the climate crisis. And so I think that has created a, a, an appetite, an activism 
um, for uh, climate action, unlike anything we've seen before. And that has happened to coincide with a favorable shift in the political winds, a favorable enough shift. Uh, you know, I would have liked to have seen large majorities, Democratic majorities, um, swept into to Congress in that last election. Um, in, 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 in that eventuality, we probably would have seen the passage of extremely bold, uh, you know, far-reaching, expansive uh, Green New Deal-like legislation. It's going to be tougher with a 50-50 Senate um, with a tie-breaking vote by the vice president. And so we're probably going to have to uh, settle for somewhat more modest climate legislation, but it will keep the ball moving forward. And then along with the executive actions the administration is taking, um, it gets us started on this path. And maybe two years from now, we'll have an even more favorable uh, environment, political environment, where we can pass even more expansive climate legislation. But I feel like we can get something done right now, legislatively. We've got a lot of um, wind in our sails um, in terms of what the Biden administration is doing, the people he's appointed, and the way they have really spread out climate across um, the, 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 the agenda of uh, every single government agency and every single cabinet level appointment. So if you're looking for reasons to be optimistic about climate action, there are a whole bunch of them right now. As I've said before, this is our time. It's refreshing to have a, an optimistic conversation about climate change, which we have just done, and it's very much appreciated. Michael Mann, Distinguished Professor of Meteorology at Penn State University, and also the author most recently of The New Climate War, The Fight to Take Back Our Planet. Michael, we appreciate your time with us today. We'd love to have you back again soon. That sounds great. It was uh, really a pleasure to talk with you. Thanks again. Thank you. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. <laughs> We want you to sit back and listen to this AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. From corporate polluters to political bosses, power elites try to create a myth of inevitability, trying to make workaday people feel helpless, too small to change the injustices of the system. Don't bother is their message. But the feisty residents of Boxtown, Tennessee, definitely did bother when they learned that a couple of profiteering fossil fuel giants were targeting them. Boxtown, a historic black neighborhood of Memphis settled by former slaves 160 years ago, was considered by Valero Energy and Plains All-American Pipeline to be politically powerless. So when these multi-billion dollar petro powers decided to ram a dirty and dangerous pipeline through the Memphis area, Boxtown was their chosen route. The rich Texas oil barons even sneeringly called the lower income community the point of least resistance. Boy, did they get that wrong. Those, quote, small people of Boxtown resisted fiercely and smartly. Most flat out refused to sell their family land at the thieving price offered by the oil slicks. They forged a unified grassroots coalition, Memphis Community Against the Pipeline, reached out to other neighborhoods, and educated locals about the terrible safety records of the two corporate plunderers. They also enlisted environmental groups to help beat back the strong-arm attempt by Valero and Plains All-American to seize the people's property through eminent domain. It's a long story with many ups and downs, but the inspiring essence of it is that local, quote, nobodies defeated the big money and raw racist arrogance of a powerhouse duo of absentee corporate elites that disrespected and misjudged them. This is Jim Hightower saying grassroots communities and coalitions are winning such gutsy fights against corporate exploiters all across America. Remember this, even the smallest dog can lift its leg on the tallest building. If you'd like more of Jim Hightower's real populism, check out the Hightower Lowdown. Jim's monthly newsletter gives you the real lowdown on which corporations, by name, are doing what to the middle class, our environment, and our democracy. Each month, the Hightower Lowdown brings you facts you didn't know along with actions you can take to fight back. It also comes with a sense of humor. Hightower believes we can fight the gods and still have fun. 
Plus, get this, it's cheap. Only $15 brings you 12 issues a year. For real populism, go to Hightowerlowdown.org. This social security measure, I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing or one time in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America, whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job. That's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. And we say hello to Dan Glickman, who represented Kansas's 4th Congressional District in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1977 to 1995, served as Secretary of Agriculture from 1995 to 2001. He's also the author, most recently, of Laughing at Myself, My Education in Congress, On the Farm, and at the Movies. Secretary Glickman, thanks for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Delighted to be with you. And to be with all the Democrats out there, too. Absolutely. And our pleasure to have you with us. So let's talk agriculture and climate change. You recently wrote an op-ed co-authored with Bob Stallman about the impact of climate change on agriculture and the global food supply and how farmers and ranchers can mitigate a growing crisis. As you look at agriculture in the U.S. today, what do you consider the most alarming repercussions of climate change? I'd say volatile weather. So droughts floods, uh, the inconsistency of weather, unpredictability of weather. There's no industry that's more impacted by the weather than agriculture. And um, so uh, the, the big thing is to make sure that our farmers and ranchers are resilient enough to be able to deal with those vagaries. And there are obviously disaster programs and crop insurance and others that protect them. But in the longer term, we're going to have to figure out a way to help farmers cope with this, uh, with uh, new farming techniques, uh, soil uh, programs, uh, uh, no-till agriculture, uh, um, using uh, better feed so animals don't expel as much methane. I mean, there are just a whole bunch of things that we're we're learning about right now that can help farmers deal with a lot of the issues, uh, you know, in climate change. And the other big issue is water. So there's probably no, it's ironic because we're getting a, going to get a giant deluge of water where I'm living right now this afternoon, but, but no industry is more dependent upon water than agriculture. 70% of the water in the world is used to irrigate crops and feed animals. 30% is for everything else. And so as we get into this climate change issue, we're going to have to figure out a way to use water more efficiently, find better crops, new technologies so that we're not using as much water uh, because we're not going to have it. We're, the aquifers in my area and, and the whole heartland are, are falling rather precipitously. So this is an issue that needs also immediate attention. Mm-hmm. And also, as you noted in the op-ed, agriculture is part of the problem. So how does farming and ranching contribute to climate change? Well, you know, clearly um, uh, overutilization of uh, crop inputs, pesticides, herbicides, other kinds of things uh, that that has an environmental impact. Uh, It probably increases the emission of carbon into the atmosphere. So anything that reduces the amount of carbon in the atmosphere is going to be really important. So that means new techniques on tillage, um, um, whether it's no-till or other kinds of things, um, will certainly be uh, helpful. And also, as I mentioned before, uh, finding animal feed that produces less methane that going into the at- atmosphere. All this requires a healthy agriculture research budget. Uh, we, we, we're a productive nation agriculturally. In large part, we've had this significant agriculture research infrastructure, USDA, uh, the land-grant college systems, and the private sector. And uh, we've seen those numbers on research go down over the last decade or two. And we can't let that happen because the only way farmers and ranchers are gonna be able to stay alive and cope with climate change is through science. 
Well, and, and obviously there is some work being done to reduce emissions from agriculture. What would you consider some of the more promising efforts that you see right now? Uh, first of all, the USDA is doing a, a, a great job and their, their natural resources conservation system, NRCS, is helping farmers uh, deal with, um, uh, you know, a variety of conservation techniques, conservation tillage, um, taking land out of production where it's highly erodible, um, and, uh, and then the research budget. And so we're also seeing, frankly, a whole generation of younger farmers, much more sensitive to uh, climate and agricultural changes. You know, for a while, I think agriculture fought climate change because they thought that uh, they were being singled out, picked on, so to speak. But we're all in this together and, and our food supply chain really does depend upon us producing food sustainably. And so I think everybody's kind of in that game now. They weren't for a long time, but, but I think they are now. Is there a difference between say the the mega giants in agriculture versus the small time farmers as far as the climate change goes and and how they're approaching things uh i think that kind of everybody's getting within the act but but to go to your basic question the very large agricultural producers have gotten bigger over the last 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 years a lot of this has to do the economies of scale and also the failure to enforce our antitrust laws, which which uh, is now we're beginning to see both this administration and Congress starting to get really interested in making sure that whether it's the Packers and Stockyards Act or our antitrust laws are, are properly enforced. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the truth of the matter is, is that we need to provide more incentives for smaller and more diversified farmers to survive. And, 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 and I think that ought to be one of the goals of public policy in this country. Well, you also note in your op-ed that current efforts, efforts uh, do not go far enough. What's missing from an overall strategy to address the role of agriculture and climate change? Um, I think it's actually starting to happen. The, the Biden administration has, in fact, put agriculture as a key part of our national strategy. And quite frankly, historically, agriculture has not been a key part of our national economic strategy generally. It's con been considered kind of a niche strategy. Well, we'll let the farmers and ranchers have their money or their thing, and it won't be part of the bigger issues. But I think that the Biden administration and Secretary Vilsack are showing real leadership in trying to elevate the role of food production and, and, and all the ramifications of food production into, a, into climate strategy, and especially as we try to reduce carbon from, into the atmosphere, sink it in the ground, doing all sorts of other things. And it also goes back to this R&D, research and development. We gotta just make sure we spend the resources to look down the road 10, 15, and 20 years, because that's one of the reasons why agriculture has been so productive in America. We're speaking to Dan Glickman, former congressman from Kansas's 4th Congressional District, also former Secretary of Agriculture from 1995 to 2001, and also author most recently of Laughing at Myself, My Education in Congress on the Farm and at the Movies. You serve on the board of the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research, and along with the U.S. Farmers and Ranchers in Action, you launched an initiative called Ag Mission to address this issue. What are some of the accomplishments of ag missions so far? Well, the first, the, first of all, the, the, uh, the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research was a great effort led by Congress to put a whole bunch of money into ag research that was not otherwise being done by our land-grant schools or our private companies. And so we're working on things like photosynthesis, how to make crops grow faster using less inputs, how to use water more efficiently, uh, desalinization techniques and, and brackish water for, for irriga irrigation, making crops that are more nutritious. And so these are all the kinds of programs that they're working on. And you know what's exciting about it is, is that not only are we getting traditional interests in agriculture, but there's an enormous amount of public investment in a lot of these new technologies. And the trick is to make sure they help smaller and medium sized farmers. Um, because in the past, they've tended to help the big guys, but not, uh, not the average family sized operation. But it's very exciting to see uh, now a lot of people talking about food and agriculture is a key part of, of how America can do a better job in coping with climate change. 
Yeah, I, I would have to say it's 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 finally in the forefront where it's always been sort of brushed aside, it seems, in recent years. But the climate crisis is unfolding at the same time the global population is growing, which means more food will have to be produced. So this is kind of tricky. How will this impact the goal of reining in, reining in agriculture's carbon footprint? Well, first of all, interesting, it's a great question, but you know, we throw away or waste about 30, 35% of our food that's grown or sold. That is, it, it's uh, the surplus food that's not eaten or used or, or just thrown in the trash can is about a third of our food production. So imagine if we could deal with that issue alone, not only could we probably feed more hungry people in the world, but we'd probably reduce uh, the climate impact, of uh, the carbon impact of of that excessive type production. So, so you know, one of the one of the ways is to look at at how do we produce food with less waste, and and uh, you know, and and that that's a big challenge. And and at the same time, we have you know millions of very hungry people in this country who who are blessed with the ability to get that that surplus food. But we're going to have to feed nine and a half, 10 billion people, 11 billion people. Right now, we're about 7.3, 7.4 billion people. And we're going to have to do that without using any more water and without overdoing uh, the world with crop inputs, with fertilizer, pesticides. I mean, we're going to need to use them in some degree, but we've got to use them much more ju judiciously than we used them before. And there's one other thing which has to do with it. The Agriculture Department is the owner and the uh, housing the U.S. Forest Service. So not only do you have drought and, and excessive rainfall, but now we have fires that are just this enormous problem. And not only the forests of the West, which are under the Department of Agriculture, but rangeland fires and, and uh, fires in parts of this country that we've never seen before. So the, and it's, this is really caused by climate change um, the, the, because we're seeing America burning at a rate we've never seen before and the rest of the world as well. So this is a problem we just all have to work on collectively. And, and now, as you point out, it's a high priority in agriculture. They know that we're an important part of, we're part of the problem, but we're also a big part of the solution as well. You spoke favorably about how the White House, President Biden, Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack are, 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 are tackling this. Is there political will elsewhere, across the aisle, everywhere else to get where we need to go? Uh, well, generally, agriculture tends to be pretty bipartisan. It's one of the more bipartisan uh, things. I mean, to be honest with you, there are some on the right who have resisted um, efforts to um, uh, to really bring uh, climate change reduction as, as, uh, as part of a major effort in food and agriculture production. Um, and uh, that's unfortunate, but, but uh, the land grant schools and the private sector and with the efforts of this, of this administration, I think are turning things in the right direction. Very good. Dan Glickman, former congressman from Kansas's 4th Congressional District, former secretary of agriculture, and most recently the author of Laughing at Myself, My Education in Congress on the Farm and at the Movies, joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Secretary Glickman, thank you so much for your time with us today. We'd love to have you back again soon. I, I'm delighted. You can call me tomorrow if you want to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, be careful what you wish okay, for. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> Thanks Thank very much. Okay, we appreciate right. it. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. So, Barry, you and I have talked about some of these issues a long time related to church and state. Uh, and I thought about you this week when I saw Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene say, quote, I say it proudly. We should be Christian nationalists. Barry Lynn, <laughs> what the hell is a Christian nationalist and should we be worried about it? 
Oh, we should be very worried about it. And in some ways, we should be more worried about the Christian nationalists who don't admit that they are (laughs) proud to be Christian nationalists. But Christian nationalism, there are kind of different stripes of it. But basically, it says we should use the Bible as the basis for secular law in the United States. And so it's it's rather dramatic. In fact, uh, I think even before you came to Washington, I used to do a radio show with a guy named John Lofton, who wrote for the Washington Times. And he was a Christian reconstructionist. And reconstructionists are, in a sense, they're just a minor diversion from being a Christian nationalist, but they literally believe that every penalty in the Bible, particularly in the Christian Old Testament, mm. need to be applied. So, And the death penalty is what should be given to people, not just for murder, but for uh, being a recalcitrant child, for <laughs> witchcraft. I mean, and, you know, I used to do this radio show at the end of the afternoons, and I'd be so angry at the end of it, it, it lasted about a year, and then the company I worked for, which seemed to have been owned, by the way, by Christian nationalists, uh, there was some kind of a tax fraud problem, and the whole network went under. But uh, those are the people I was dealing with, and they're all over the United States. What do they want? What do they really want? They want an entirely Christian government. They want a Christian government. They do not want people in public office who are not Christians. They don't want atheists. They don't want even uh, what uh, one one of them refers to as so-called Christians. That would be people mm. like me. And uh, <laughs> they don't want any Jews. And of course, uh, also this this week, uh, the Republican running for the, uh, the governor's position in Pennsylvania, Doug Mastriano, has also gotten in trouble for basically paying a Christian nationalist who runs a a, a social media outfit that is virulently anti-Semitic. Yeah, right. Uh, Andrew Torba is his name. Torba. Uh, He's a consultant to Doug Mastriano, who is the Republican nominee for governor in Pennsylvania. So Torba wrote this week, a quote, We don't want people who are atheists. We don't want people who are Jewish. This is an explicitly Christian movement because this is an explicitly Christian country. Uh, Barry, there's so much wrong with that. Where do you start, right? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, but this idea that, you know, this, uh, when I was running Americans United for Separation of Church and State, which I did for 25 years, but there were people on the fringes like David Barton, mm, who was a big yep. fan, and Newt Gingrich was, a, when he was Speaker of the House, was a big fan of David Barton, a kind of pseudo-historian, who basically was a Christian nationalist and wanted people to roam around Washington and look at the proof in the buildings in Washington that this was founded as a Christian nation. Bingo. Yeah, right. Um, so, but I guess... Christian nation. I mean, what kind of Christianity and who decides what kind of Christians are okay and which ones are not, right? It's their brand of Christianity that they're talking about. No, it's very much their kind, and their kind is very extreme. Their kind does not, uh, as as you just quoted, uh, the nominee for governor in Pennsylvania, there are so-called Christians, there are they don't belong. And mm. Christianity is to be defined by how much, not only your personal life in theory, we'll get to that in a minute, but also the entire policy structure of the country is supposed to be based on biblical principles. Then how do you square that Christian nationalists lining up behind Donald Trump? If there's, It seems to me if there's anybody who represents the exact opposite of Christian moral values, it's Donald Trump. Yes, and if you told them that, they would find a reason to explain how he was a beginning Christian. He was he had rediscovered <laughs> Christianity. Uh, James Dobson allegedly said, "I can't prove this that that uh, Trump was a baby Christian <laughs> during his first campaign." But um, 
No, it is. It is very difficult to accept this. Very difficult to believe it, and very difficult to believe that there are actually people who believe every single public policy facing the United States is explained and an answer given directly by the Bible. Mm. So you say, I wonder what that is. Well, in my day, uh, before things got quite as extreme as they are now, there was a fellow named Wayne Grudem, G-R-U-D-E-M. And Wayne Grudem wrote a book called uh, Policy According to the Bible. And in it, he didn't just talk about abortion and gay marriage and all of the things that he was against, but he even had a biblical citation for the next kind, the next generation of fighter planes that ought to be purchased <laughs> by the Air Force, the F-16. I mean, and then literally just, uh, just the other day, um, I was on a show with a, a guy who played a clip of a, of a pastor somewhere in the Midwest who actually said that even term limits mm. is in the Bible. Term limits. I think it was in the book of Isaiah, but uh, I somehow, you know, I went to seminary and I just must have missed that class. And guns. You know, that's another thing. Guns. Oh, yeah. When I when I first got out of a, a little medical problem, I had a, I spoke to the American atheists, and the American atheists always like me. In fact, they usually introduce me by saying, "This is Barry Lynn. He's the only." Th- theist. We don't want to convert to atheism. But I talked to them about a church service in Western Pennsylvania that had occurred just a few months before, which was a a kind of a remarriage or a kind of marriage rehabilitation session. A lot of people have them, you know, renew their vows and also a blessing of assault rifles all in the same service. Oh, good Lord. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, and wh- why, what is guns? Where is that in the Bible? We didn't even have guns, did we? And that there's a reference in the book of Revelation to rods of iron, ah. which they mean, they say, that covertly means guns. Any kind. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.